Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ has entered, not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia! Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin, once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia.
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from the first letter of Peter. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, 
and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The word of the Lord. reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved, and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, I don't know about you, but these days I'm often feeling exhausted and looking for solace, looking for relief and rest. I find that some of my best rest and rejuvenation comes from my time out in nature. So I hope you appreciate a different approach to my sermon today. I'd like to have these videos of some of the beauty around our parish grounds playing in the background as I talk. And I hope that they may connect a little bit both with your soul in that thirst for rest as well as a little bit of the theme that we're talking about today. So the psalm that we have assigned for our reading today is probably the most beloved and most known of all of those in our scriptures. If you know any psalms, it's probably this one. The Lord is my shepherd. And it's a psalm of comfort and provision. So if there's any time we might want to spend more time understanding and thinking over this message, what better time than now? Most of us haven't grown up around sheep the way that the original writer and audience of this psalm did. So it might seem odd to us that the term shepherd is associated with a figure of power like God. But back then, it was common amongst many ancient Near East people to refer to both gods and kings as the shepherd of their people. So when they would hear shepherd here, they would know that they're hearing a claim of authority and power in the form of a relatable metaphor. So the poet has set a stage here and now is going to go on to describe the form and nature of this Lord's care. To lie down in green pastures and be led by still waters is evidence that this king has provided what his people need. It's the sign that the king is fulfilling his role. In the ancient world, before the emergence of the great empires, kingship was often seen as a contract between the people and the ruler. The people promised full obedience and support in exchange for leadership and provision. So under this understanding, any leader who rules for their own benefit and does not provide for the people has broken the agreement and nullified the contract. So the claim here is that this king is legitimate. He has fulfilled his responsibilities on behalf of those pledged to his rule. The traditional translation usually reads here, he revives my soul. But the Hebrew here is very clearly describing the renewal of all of human wholeness. This isn't simply speaking of an inward sense of peace, but of real full physical provision for the body and justice for the entire community. This king is guiding his people along a righteous way that reflects and magnifies his true integrity and character showing in his actions what his essence and nature are. Now, at this point, the subject shifts from God to the speaker. Now, I walk through a valley. There's an implication here that this person has set off on their own, rather than being directed precisely as in the first verses. But even though the poet has taken agency, possibly on a path that is not guided by the wisdom of the ruler, he continues to have conviction that God remains present and watchful. No matter how dark, dangerous, or deadly the valley becomes, the psalmist trusts that God will never be absent in these trials, and this relieves his fears. And there's a confidence that God will keep things on track. The rod and staff have both shepherd and king connotations. As a shepherd, he uses sticks to protect, direct, and discipline the sheep. And as king, the rod and scepter are symbols of the power held over the people to maintain order and justice. Finally, to sit at feast with enemies present implies a level of victory or control over them. This king is victorious and unrivaled in power, 
so the people do not have to worry. The psalmist wraps up his poem by talking about the ample provision provided. The oil here is not actually for anointing in the sense of anointing a king or a prophet, but rather speaks of luxurious comfort and satisfied physical desires. Everything that is needed is provided, and even more besides. The psalmist ends with an affirmation. Yes, this king is worthy of the bargain that was pledged. Life is better under his rule than under any other, or even in attempting to live outside of obligation. So there are a number of implications and applications we could consider today some more comfortable than others, and they apply also to how Jesus picks up some of these themes in the gospel here and elsewhere as well. What I'm thinking about is this idea of a contract between God and his people. It's not one that we like to think about in the modern world, but it's rising up again from these ancient times to challenge our assumptions about how the world works. The idea is this, that if we want what God promises, if we want provision, presence, guidance, the fullness of life, then we have an obligation in return. We're expected to turn over agency and ownership. Our time, our possessions, our loyalties, our goals. These may be asked to be given up in exchange for what is offered. Even as I say this, I struggle with the words. It could sound like a cult, like an authoritarian tyrant trying to take away that which our culture has decided is the ultimate good, freedom. And it may very well be that some listening to this think it's a bargain best left in the dustbin of three millennia ago and have no interest in considering it. But for myself, I'm left wondering... What is it that our desire for freedom above all else buys us? Is it possible that we've signed up for something without recognizing fully what we've bought? What if our very insistence on unlimited freedom is a driving force behind a world that often looks very little like that promised in this psalm? Certainly the early followers of Jesus that we hear about today in the Acts of the Apostles seem to have a different understanding of this bargain that we Americans do. They gave up their possessions, donating them to a common pool to provide for all. They were united in common prayer. They gave up their agency for this kingdom, in trust that their king would give them more than they could obtain on their own. So I wonder, is there something that we might experiment with in this bargain ourselves today? Maybe we try giving up some time and devote ourselves to regular daily prayer and see if something comes from that bargain. Maybe we give up some money, dedicating it to the kingdom's common good. Maybe we come together, safely of course, and share our lives with less of the barriers that we put up between us, insisting on rules of private ownership and private benefit, and become open to the possibility that it is in giving up some of our deepest desires that we may actually find them truly fulfilled. I would like to end by repeating Psalm 23 according to a translation that I created recently. Psalm 23 it is as shepherd that Hashem is to me. Nothing do I lack. In meadows of lush grass he allows me long restful rumination. To quiet waters guides me. My life he revives. On the true path he leads, according to his nature. When I walk in gloom of deathly darkness, no harm I fear, for you are with me. 
Your pulling crook and your nudging staff encourage me onward. You spread a feast before me, even as foes lurk. My body soothed with aromatic oils, my portion provided. These goods and pledges are my constant companions all the days of my life. And I shall make pilgrimage to the house of Hashem for many years to come. Amen. Standing now, let us join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O God, whose Son Jesus is the Good Shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his name, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who, with you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity, and in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
we offer our prayers to Jesus, who is the good shepherd and guardian of our souls, responding to each petition by saying, Hear us, O risen Christ. For the parishes and missions of our diocese, that we will devote ourselves to the teaching and fellowship of Christ, to the breaking of bread and the offering of prayers, let us pray. that an outpouring of generosity will flow from the gratitude and thanksgiving that dwell in our hearts, moving the church, the household of faith, to provide relief to those in any want or need. Let us pray. For the courage to share the faith we hold and the willingness to listen humbly to those whose interpretation of the faith differs from our own, let us pray. For all who exercise leadership, that their actions may reflect the ways of the servant, whose obedience to God released the power to overcome every darkness, and whose sacrifice opened the gates to eternity, let us pray. In thanksgiving for our merciful Jesus, who loves us beyond our shame and guilt, frees us from the tombs of our past, and invites us to receive his gift of overwhelming forgiveness, let us pray. That we may not fear the day of judgment, but entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly, let us pray. Let us continue our prayers in the name of the one in whom we sing the triumphant strain, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. We pray now for those on our prayer list. Tom, Lynn, Colleen, Marion, Shirley, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Lauren, Odell, Irene, Rich, Kevin, Rayland, Mike, Carrie, Alicia, Lee, Doug, Benny, Tom, Ozzie, Janice, Alice, Deborah, James, Derby, Emily, Beth, John, Jimmy, Father John, and Dustin. For all who have died in communion of your church, especially Barbara Eller, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal, we pray to you, O Lord. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. On the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Matthew's, Charleston. And in our companion diocese in Columbia, we pray for the Reverend Rafael Abucar, Parroquia Nuestro Salvador. Additional prayers may be offered at this time, either aloud or in the silence of your own heart. In this time, as we wait for things to emerge, to change, to return, grant us patience and endurance, support and peace, provision and health. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
let us join together in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And now we recognize the birthdays and anniversaries of those in our church for this week. We are thankful for the birthdays of Charles, Mason, and John, and for the anniversary of Eric and Renee. Let us pray this birthday prayer together. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the birthday of these your children, we pray that the year ahead will be one of blessing and peace and that the year will bring continual joy in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now this anniversary prayer. Loving God, you have blessed this couple with the gift of marriage. We pray that they may continue to love, honor, and cherish each other, and that they will find in each other the reflection of your abiding and sustaining grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Events today continue the same pattern we have been experiencing for recent weeks. Uh, at 9 o'clock this morning, we conducted our second discussion on the topic of uh, Cynthia Bourgeau's The Wisdom Jesus. You are welcome to join at any point. If you would like, you can simply join via telephone or a Zoom app and be part of that discussion. Following this service at 11, we will have our Zoom coffee hour. Again, you can join by phone. And this is just an opportunity to, to chat, to see one another, um, to share our lives. We will also be offering our Tuesday and Thursday evening prayers this week. Those will be at 7.30 still, um, Tuesday and Thursday at 7.30 on our YouTube channel. We had a conference with the bishop of the, our diocese last week, um, and so far the bishop is saying that we will remain closed at least through May 15th, likely longer. Um, and we are working on plans of how we will stage reopening gradually. At this point, all of the clergy in West Virginia are assuming that services will be not going back to usual for quite some time to come. We will try to find safe ways to reopen to smaller groups and to have safety precautions but we do not anticipate going back to full attending services the way we had before for quite some time. Please continue reaching out as you have need or as you would like to help others, and we will make those connections. 
and let us remain working on our community even while we must remain separate. And now, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.